Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on blood viscosity, the common denominator for cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, today's webinar will be presented by uh, Dr. Ralph Holsworth, um, who's been with us at Meridian Valley Lab and Toma Clinic. Um, he is a board-certified osteopathic family physician, and he possesses unique expertise in cardiovascular diseases, blood viscosity monitoring, and therapeutic aspects of uh, natokinase. He is a very experienced clinical researcher, and he has been the author of several publications on antioxidant properties of electrolyzed water and uh, anti-viscosogenic therapies. He's had many very, uh, uh, very um, distinguished prior appointments and honors, and we are very happy to have him here today to present to you today's webinar on blood viscosity. And with that, I welcome Dr. Ralph Holsworth. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Caitlin, and good afternoon. And welcome everyone to today's Meridian Valley Lab uh, webinar. And our title of presentation, as Caitlin mentioned, was Blood Viscosity, the Common Denominator for Cardiovascular Health. This is something I've been involved with for over um, just about a decade, over 10 years actually, and very passionate about. And today's agenda I'd like to outline is basically looking at um, blood viscosity, uh, just a simple overview. Secondly, we'll look at blood viscosity in direct correlation with cardiovascular diseases. We'll also see how it also contributes to other medical conditions. And then fourthly, we'll look at actually therapies, anti-viscogenic therapies that you as practitioners can apply in your clinical and hospital settings. And last point will be innovations, where we're going with blood viscosity monitoring and future developments for providing, I think, a new dimension in our inroads to impacting cardiocerebral vascular diseases. So if we look at blood viscosity, I like to think of it as the unifying theory, if you will, of cardiovascular or atherogenesis. I think a lot of the questions I had in medical school and a lot of uh, my colleagues, uh, the audience included, has is why are the atherosclerotic plaques not uniformly distributed? I mean, if we look at cholesterol and, the, you know, those theories, those suggest that we have elevated cholesterol systemically, but that's not what we find. Uh, we find plaques are not uniformly distributed. We find that they're at specific flow bifurcations, branch sites. We also see them in the arterial walls, and we also see that plaques form in areas where the shear force is high. And specifically, as you see outlined in region one, we have the carotids, and region uh, down to region two, the abdominal a aorta. And then lastly, distally, we see it impacting our peripheral or the peripheral arterial type diseases. So we'll go into that. And we see that even in JAMA 1999, you know, specifically showing that there was a hemodynamic shear stresses and specific roles in atherosclerosis. So let's drill down on this. Let's look at blood viscosity and specifically plaque growth, plaque growth, excuse me, and rupture. So as we look at a lot of these flow dy uh, dynamics, one of the things I digress was I worked uh, as a nuclear power uh, plant propulsion operator and had fluid mechanics. And a lot of the things I was trying to do, minimizing corrosion in the primary and, and minimize other flow disturbances to prevent uh, other, uh, you know, uh, piping problems there, was that I looked at those different evaluations of the flow dimetrics. And we see that same paradigm we can apply to the human vasculature. It's a closed system, and we see that high syst systolic blood viscosities can cause abrasions. And 
that is important to know because that uh, can cause specific problems there as far as you know endothelial uh, dysfunction. And the other thing is that we also see that blood flow changes. It's uh, what we call a non-Newtonian fluid, and therefore it changes with different shear rates uh, in, in the body, uh, sometimes up to fourfold between diastole and systolic um, blood viscosities. And then we see on the diastolic blood viscosities, that can cause what we call low shear flows. And there's also problems there that can occur when we get counter eddy currents. Um, and those have their own effect uh, specifically on the endothelium. It's what we call a mechanical transduction. And we actually find that blood viscosity is really, the, again, the common denominator that ties all of these regional and very specific pathophysiologies together. So let's look at whole blood viscosity as a hemodynamic biomarker. All of us are familiar with the biochemical aspects of, of atherogenesis, but what I'd like to present today is looking at the biophysics. You know, what's occurring on the physics or the fluid mechanics of blood flow, not only in the arterial, but more importantly in microcirculation as well as the venous side. And we'll look at different parameters such as the actual physical friction against the blood vessels. And you hear me say often whole blood viscosity is where the rubber hits the road. And I literally mean that. It's, it's where the increased blood viscosity hits the endothelium. And we'll talk about work of the heart. Uh, simply, it's easier to uh, pump wine than it is ketchup. Uh, it's a physical characteristic uh, that is well noted. And also we'll look at oxygen delivery to both organs and tissues. And also upstream where we find that we can recruit more oxygen if we have blood viscosities that are actually lower. So looking at the direct measure of flow ability, in other words, you know, shear being the, a measurement of the ability of something to deform or flow. And I always say we want our, you know, you want to go with the flow. You want to increase the flow ability of your blood. And the single way to do that um, is, is to decrease the, the actual physical thickness of that. And we'll go into looking at the existing therapies and some other uh, perhaps novel approaches to looking at that as an overall biomarker uh, for improving circulatory health. So let's go back and review cardiovascular diseases as the leading causes of death in the United States. And as you can see, if we had one particular disease set, if you will, to go after, Certainly cardio, and I, I like to include cerebral vascular disease as being one of our primary targets. And one, one thing that intrigued me with blood viscosity and uh, my introduction to Dr. Young Cho and Dr. Kinsey uh, over a decade ago was that they were able to share with me uh, over 800 publications from independent researchers, and they clearly denoted that all of these independent studies, independent researchers, literally blinded from their own research from their other colleagues, came up with the same definitive answer as to what was causing atherosclerosis. And it, all of them, and again, that's why I call it the unifying cardiovascular disease uh, biomarker, is that it was whole blood viscosity. You look at male gender. Why are males uh, genetically predisposed to earlier heart diseases? We look at age, smoking, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and even look at some aspects of the cholesterol. And we're, more, we're able to specifically drill in and find what is causing the, the nidus or the the initial inflammatory 
cascade that's contributing to the increased whole blood viscosity. I think you'll be impressed with the statistical significance of this one parameter. As I previously mentioned, blood is a non-Newtonian fluid. And what that simply means is that when we apply various shears to the blood, it changes. Now water is non-compressible and, and it is a Newtonian fluid. So therefore, no matter how much shear you impart in water, the viscosity or the thickness of the water remains the same. That's not so for blood. And the reason is the red blood cells. If you physically could take out the red blood cells from blood, it would not flow. And again, that's um, typically what we see with the uh, blood in the body, basically looking at that aspects. So we'll define shear on this, um, on this graph here. If you look at the far left-hand side there, that would correspond more when the heart is, is uh, relaxed or during diastole. And then we look across on the right-hand side, and that will be where the blood is uh, during systole, higher shear rates. So we see the blood shearing at higher rates and the thickness of it correspondingly on our y-axis being lower. And as you can see, there can be up to a four to five fold difference just between every other beat of our heart there uh, contributing that. And today, one of the major uh, innovations in this diagnostics is the, is the ability to capture the blood viscosity throughout the cardiac cycle. We can tell what the blood viscosity is doing throughout uh, the heart. And more importantly, as we're annotating here in this graph, is that at different shear rates, different components uh, can contribute to the overall increase in blood viscosity. We look at some of the strong ties uh, with hypertension. And I, I want to make it clear that all we're, um, we're very grateful to the previous uh, leaders in cardiovascular disease. Uh, and we, we are just adding additional information and literally shifting the starting line of cardiovascular disease or atherogenesis from the endothelium into the blood. Uh, that's all I think we're seeing here. And just showing that where the problem begins is actually in the tissue of the blood. And as you can see here, with the folk study here in European Heart Journal, he was able to show, again, a causal relationship between blood viscosity and blood pressure and randomized. Now we look at this further studies here, we break those down into quintiles of ages, adjust it for, and then you have the diamond and the square representing systolic and diastolic respectfully. You can see the direct mean blood pressures change accordingly with blood viscosities. Again, further data showing again that the P factor here being very significant for both genders being greater than 0 0.001 um, and then also correlating uh, directly systolic blood pressure with the blood viscosity in the males as well as diastolic. Again, the blood viscosity validates other earlier studies, but more specifically defines why certain patients are going to experience cardiovascular disease with cholesterol. And again, it's a multifactorial picture. Uh, you, as, as we clinicians know, that we have to look at multiple different factors contributing to a patient's overall cardio cerebral vascular health. Now we know LDL values, actually the so-called bad cholesterols can actually increase blood viscosity. And then the antithesis is that, of course, the HDL, the good cholesterol, can decrease blood viscosity. But again, all of these 
uh, are indicated um, as having an association with the risk of atherosclerosis, but more clearly defines their role. Now, one of the things that I found fascinating has actually been uh, very significant for uh, patients of mine in their cessation of cigarette smoking was simply explaining to males uh, how the blood viscosity or thickness can increase, increase up to fourfold. Of course, we see smoking causes up to a 20% increase sometimes in blood viscosity, depending again on the degree of the you know, cigarette use. And again, the Journal of Cardiovascular Risk in 1995. We'll look at some outcome trials here. Fairly large randomized trials here, European Journal of Clinical Investigation. And they drill down on a population of almost 1,600, both men and females, ages 20, 55 to 74. Some fairly high uh, uh, rates of uh, heart attacks and strokes in that population, but they averaged it out over five years and adjusting for age and sex. Again, they found that the mean blood viscosity is significantly higher with those patients that with ischemic MIs and strokes. A significant uh, P factor there of 0 0.0003. And again, showing the strong correlation there between diastolic blood pressure, also your LDLC, and also even a stronger relation than smoking. We look at other peer-reviewed uh, Edinburgh artery study here, again showing the correlation of blood viscosity. Not quite as large a study, but still respectable, 331 middle-aged, uh, highly susceptible to hypertension of men there. And they followed them up for an average of almost five years. And again, we look at the trend tells of diastolic blood viscosity, and again, we see those correlate with uh, the solid line being greater than uh, 24.3, the uh, blood viscosities, and then we look at the uh, going, decreasing the blood viscosity with actually the dashed lines. And again, you see the event-free survivability increase inversely to the blood viscosities in these hypertensive men. And again, if a, a respectable P factor of 0 0.006 and almost 95% confidence intervals as well. We actually looked at the top trend tile and it showed them over three times increased risk of cardiovascular events. So really allows us as physicians to drill down and triage, if you will, our patients on an individual letter, uh, level and find out specifically what's contributing to either the hypertension and more specifically whether it's a diastolic or systolic increase in their blood viscosity. This is an excellent publication, Stroke 1992, correlating chronic blood viscosity in patients with acute stroke, transient ischemic, fairly respectable, little larger study, 430 patients here, but divided into uh, four subgroups of the acute ischemic stroke, TIs, or transient ischemic attacks, those with stroke risk factors, and then healthy controls. This study, I think, was very significant because it actually develops and establishes some safe areas. Uh, you look on the y-axis diastolic blood viscosities and centipoise, we actually are beginning to see some levels that, you know, we can measure and define as sort of safe areas. Uh, and this specific, specific one was, you know, lower than, uh, you know, in healthy controls was approximately 37 uh, centipoise. And then, then we're also defining on the other end areas of danger, uh, if you will, critical values that we have established, that are established in the literature, and that we as physicians can reference and it, and it actually uh, will you know, allow us to t determine which of our patients are at a higher risk as we see their blood viscosities go up and treat them um, you know, accordingly 
obviously some of our patients' higher blood viscosities, we're going to be wanting to treat them more aggressively when we see their diastolic blood viscosities increase. And again, you see the, the uh, different uh, mean diastolic blood viscosities for each subgroup. Now, interesting, um, we call diabetes the disease of opathies. And of course, we were careful to, to, when we look at the circulatory issues, we look at small vessel and large vessel diseases. But interestingly, the hemodynamic and metabolic links in type 2 diabetes are very uh, sensitive uh, parameters that increase blood viscosity. I actually worked on the Indian Health Service uh, back in 01, 2001, and I actually was doing work with blood viscosities, and I was able to pick up uh, which patients had insulin resistance uh, a lot of times more quickly than even doing some of the standardized tests with the fasting um, insulin, of course, uh, and glucose. Of course, we weren't doing the more elaborate uh, insulin glucose tolerance test that we do here at Meridian Valley, but I, I did see a very significant increase in blood viscosity, which correlated exactly with increased uh, insulin, increased uh, glucose levels. We also see during metabolic or, you know, Syndrome X, uh, we also see significant decreases in PI-1, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, um, and that actually is, uh, increases uh, susceptibility. We also look at the microvascular, whether it's you know, peripheral neuropathies or nephropathies or kidneys or even the retinopathies of the eyes. Those are all small vessel diseases and are very susceptible to increase blood viscosities. So one of the things I can propose with managing some of these chronic diseases is that measuring their whole blood viscosities and being uh, zealous and uh, aggressive in treatment, uh, we, we as physicians are going to be able to prevent uh, complications such as amputations, dialysis in patients that we see with metabolic or diabetes. Again, another link here between the metabolic syndrome uh, correlating here with uh, middle-aged Chinese. It's a fairly large study, 1,400 Chinese people, 35, 59 years, divided into quartiles of viscosity, and actually showed the metabolic syndrome group being twice as likely in the highest quartile uh, than the lowest there. So, significant risk factor there based upon the elevated blood viscosities. And this publication here, the American Journal of Epidemiology uh, 08, actually mirrors the same clinical findings I was seeing on the Indian Reservation in 01. Uh, where they correlated blood viscosities and metacrits as risk factors for type 2. This was a, a very large study, relatively uh, 12,000, almost uh, 13,000 total. They were initially non-diabetic. Again, high risk years of 45 to 64 years for chronic diseases. And again, divided those up accordingly. And again, strong correlation, blood viscosity predicted the incident of type 2 diabetes, and the highest blood viscosity showing 60% more likely to develop diabetes than the lowest. And again, the overall trend p-factor was less than 0 0.001. These are some other studies here, again, mirroring the same same pathophysiology of diabetes with blood viscosities with and without retinopathy. Comparative studies with diabetic retinopathy and blood viscosity again. Um, and lastly, again, showing another Lancet article with blood viscosity in diabetic patients. 
And this is just a quick overview, a summarization of those three papers here. And again, showing the fairly consistent 11.6, 10.5, 13.9 increase in systolic blood viscosities, as well as uh, 30, 25.9, and 21.0 being the increase for diastolic blood viscosity. And let me just expand upon diastolic blood viscosity. As you can see, there's almost a, almost a threefold increase there percentage. And if you think about the heart, the coronary arteries feed themselves during diastole. And so one of the hypotheses I'm sharing with you today is that perhaps we've all had patients that had acute MIs. And then they've done further studies and they haven't found any plaque. They, they, uh, and one of the things I'm suggesting here is that at certain times that the increased diastolic blood viscosity will gel. The blood physically will gel at the increased thickness, and these are at the critical times when the myocardium is, is in need of the blood from the coronaries. So again, more correlations with blood viscosities elevated with obesities. These would parallel the previous studies in diabetes with glucose tolerance and insulin status as well. Another study here, again, I think the central pathophysiology for all of us integrative and functional doctors is, is much the same. We still see diastolic blood viscosity 15% higher as opposed to uh, those, and we actually see that abnormality there. But again, I think this is simply mirroring the, the uh, pathophysiology that we're seeing with insulin and glucose. Now we go further, um, the old saying was, if it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain. Uh, a number of the studies show that, that link being tied to blood viscosity, whole blood viscosities. You can't use it if you don't perfuse it. And um, I think that's very germane to blood viscosity, cognitive decline. I'm looking at a number of papers now uh, with the muscle sclerosis and defining what's going on with the blood-brain barrier and actually they, it's, they call the, the hemoneuro connection and the coupling of that. And I think at the end of the day we'll find that the whole blood viscosity is actually contributing to that disease in some form or fashion. But suffice it to say in this study with almost uh, a little over 450 elderly correlating cognitive test at 10 and 14 year endpoints and basically uh, overall showed that the blood viscosity predicted the cognitive decline for over four years. And then controlling for age, we also saw an increased uh, of blood viscosities with the, uh, with the decrease in the cognitive scores as well. And, it's, and then increasing blood viscosity also correlated with individuals and their particular decrease in their scores. Now this is a blood viscosity and I found fascinating uh, with some of my obstetrics patients there developing preeclampsia, inner uterine growth, retardation, Specifically, uh, not a large study, uh, but still, um, we had 23 women with mild, moderate preeclampsia, 10 women with inner uterine growth retardations, and then 22 age and gestation match controls accordingly. And again, we see both abnormal groups had significantly increased blood viscosity. And in the patients that I personally have monitored, I saw increased blood viscosity increase approximately six weeks prior to the clinical manifestations of preeclampsia. So it's something that those physicians that are still out there delivering babies and doing prenatal, I, I encourage them to make this a part of their prenatal labs. Check the blood viscosity. Uh, we may be able to prevent a miscarriage or you know, 
determine ahead of time whether this patient is at a higher susceptibility for preeclampsia or, or eclampsia, and, and in addition, see if we can prevent any, you know, uh, any development of intrauterine growth re, uh, retardation in the woman's uh, fetus. Again, another um, American Journal of Obstetrics uh, in association with preeclampsia. And they looked at both both low and high shear, uh, showing a significant uh, correlation with the preeclamptic group. Uh, in the, and actually, the low shear difference was almost two times greater than the high shear difference. And again, the summary there suggests that their conclusion suggested that the measure of whole blood viscosity may be clinically useful in the management of patients with preeclampsia. We also looked at women with pregnancy-induced hypertension, and again, uh, correlating control of their blood pressure and you know, the prevention of that. We actually see uh, in this study that the diuretics led to a hemoconcentration and an overall increase of blood viscosity. And that actually, uh, as I previously mentioned, the blood viscosity increase preceded the actual clinical development and signs and symptoms of the preeclampsia by six weeks. We look at, again, as I mentioned, miscarriage. If you do have a patient with a history of miscarriages, uh, I would encourage or consider measuring their whole blood viscosity. I've been able to pick up, um, pick up uh, factor 5 Leiden, incidentally, by just measuring blood viscosities. And uh, I was suspicious when doing their gestational history. I find that they've had two or three, four miscarriages. That's something that, or have even a difficulty getting pregnant, uh, something to consider as well. And after uh, treating those patients, uh, I've had two women with factor V completely refuse the low molecular weight heparin injections. I actually use natokinase. And both of them had two successful viable births, uh, no complications, uh, much to the dismays of their obstetrician. Well, let's look at this whole new paradigm shift. And I'm, we hear about anticoagulants and antihypertensives and anti this and anti that. But what I'd like to propose today is a whole new realm of therapies that we can call anti-viscogenic agents. And I know a number of my colleagues out there are already using those as functional and integrative doctors. And one of the elements of confusion, not only for my patients, but more importantly for my colleagues, is the confusion of anticoagulation quote unquote blood thinning and blood thinners and then the correlation with whole blood viscosity. And, the, and this is an important distinction. I think what we see here is that academically or intellectually uh, perhaps we were lazy in corresponding what warfarin and aspirin and clopidogrel and all these other anticoagulants did, and it was simply easier to say that the blood was thin, therefore it wouldn't clot. And we, we should have been perhaps a little bit more intellectually responsible and said that we were inhibiting the clotting procedure. So uh, all I would like to, general statement is saying that, you know, blood thinners uh, are a misnomer. Uh, they are anticoagulants, but anticoagulants not often are that. And I use the concrete analogy. Uh, if you've ever poured concrete, uh, the more red blood cells in it, uh, or the more rocks in your concrete, the thicker it is. But more importantly, if we, the, the thickness of the concrete is going to, is the same, but we put accelerants in it or retardants in it to either make it form solid concrete quicker or to retard or slow the solidification of it. Well, if you t extend that analogy to anticoagulants, 
that's all that process is doing, whether you're giving the patient aspirin or warfarin or any of the other traditional anticoagulants, all they're doing, the, the blood is still thick, or it, it still has the same viscosity or thickness. All we're doing is changing that. Now, with an antiviscogenic agent, we're actually physically changing the thickness. And those really are the true blood thinners, if you will. But not having an adverse effect on the coagulation cascade. Well, let's boil this down. What are our therapeutic targets? So what are the four things that make blood thick? Well, 50% of the time, we can simply look at our CBC, excuse me, complete blood count, and evaluate that and see what the volume of red blood cells is. If it's elevated, which it traditionally is with men or women who have, for whatever reasons, no menses, then we will see an, an elevated uh, hematocrit. And again, back to my analogy, red blood cells are very similar to aggregate or rocks in the concrete. The more rocks in your concrete, the thicker the concrete mud is. Same thing, the more red blood cells in your blood, the thicker your blood is. We actually see a correlation of a decrease of 10% in your hematocrit will cause a corresponding decrease of 26% in your whole blood viscosity. So as physicians, we can almost calculate if you do apheresis or if your patients donate blood, which I strongly encourage um, as a ability to safely decrease their, the whole blood viscosity. Second point is decreased plasma viscosity. Well, again, this goes back to hydration. So many of us see all of our patients coming in at some form of subclinical dehydration. And working in the emergency rooms, as some of us have done, we see the little old lady coming in on a beta blocker, diuretics, furosemide, HCTZ, and she fell down. Well, again, um, a lot of what my therapies were were aggressively hydrating them and providing them with magnesium sulfate in an IV form, and their blood pressures would come down. But again, going back to hydration, the in blood viscosity or plasma viscosity particularly will shift your whole curve down. So it's going to decrease your diastolic and systolic whole blood viscosity. So it's a win-win and um, it's something that we all need to implement for each and every patient. The third modality here or therapeutic target is red blood cell deformability. And we look at all of those different things um, and then um, look at also red blood cell aggregation and sedimentation as well. Now, back to reducing the hematocrit, again, I encourage all my patients, if you've looked at the recent uh, Dr. Wright's newsletter, he has referenced some research showing that patients who donate blood over their whole life can have an 88 percent decrease in the incidence of heart attacks or strokes. That's a pretty good return on investment there. And I also encourage two-unit red blood cell apheresis as well. And these are hypovolemic hemodilutions as well as isovolemic hemodilutions. And then one of the other things that we see uh, with cardiac bypass is actually what they call a hypervolemic hemodilution. And, you know, maybe that process is more significant in the prevention of future cardiac uh, problems with those patients in the actual bypass surgery. So we look at reducing, again, the hematocrit. Again, this was the uh, journal quoted here, American Journal of Epidemiology. Um, my patient's a little bit shy of needles. Uh, I show them this study, and uh, they can figure, do the math, and this is a great way to motivate them, and again, 50% of the time, by decreasing blood viscosity, 
uh, simply by donating blood. Again, this is just a graphic chart of 2,868 males, uh, high prone years of cardiovascular disease, 42 to 60, and again, seeing the significant decrease in their event rate um, by donating blood. Here's another correlation with uh, lipo density or the low density lipo uh, protein apheresis on blood viscosity. This is uh, showing those correlations in respect of uh, reductions uh, in the blood viscosity. It's a fairly elaborate procedures. I know uh, some of the uh, university based do this process. Also have correlated reducing hematocrit and uh, also what we call exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, this is something that plagues a lot of the racehorses, uh, thoroughbreds, etc. And again, we've been able to show initial studies that we correlate this with increased blood viscosity for that horse. Uh, a horse is unique where 50% of the blood volume is actually stored in the spleen. And then upon exercise or racing, uh, 50, that 50% 50 of in the spleen is dumped into the systemic circulatory. And it's liter literally uh, the, the horse is having trouble getting that blood back into the spleen when we see the hemorrhaging occurring. We look at other ways to decrease plasma viscosity. I mentioned hydration or what we call the oral rehydration solution standard and international world health organizations uh, in many countries um, using that. We also use normal saline, 6% uh, head of starch, also volume repletions um, that we implement in the hospitals and clinics as well. And then in addition, I've done some recent research with reduced alkalinized water, uh, and they actually used that in dialysis units over in Japan, uh, again with the en uh, enhanced ability with decreasing plasma viscosity. We look at the other uh, parameters there of how do we make the red blood cells more deformable. And as we remember, um, the different sizes, the red blood cells actually have to uh, have to bend and fold to get through the microvasculature. So if they're not pliable, if they're not deformable, then they're going to literally bottleneck as we get through the, go through the different arterial to capillary beds there. As some of the, the pressure step-offs there increase. So we look at lipid nutrition being very important overall for the nutritional uh, components of urethrocytes or red blood cells. The red blood cell membrane in and of itself has 60 different types of phosphatidylcholine. These are strategic structural um, parts of the membrane that allow it to be flexible. We also look at uh, the um, phenylcalcium magnesium butyrate or short chain fatty acids that also help with uh, red blood cell deformability, and also just looking strictly at the essential fatty acids there, unsaturated, specifically helping with red blood cell deformability. And then we look at what we see through our microscopes, rouleauing, uh, and actually the aggregation, sedimentation of those things, uh, increasing blood viscosity. Some of the initial studies with natokinase, uh, I've uh, helped support at the University of uh, Southern California, Keck School of Medicine showed in vivo a decrease in red blood cell aggregation sedimentation up to 20% with using natokinase. We also have an unpublished study I did with approximately 40 patients where we did an actual whole blood viscosity on them showing decreased blood viscosity. Uh, predominantly more diastolic or during the low shear uh, blood viscosity ranges. Also, Mucos uh, published a number of studies with benzyme 
showing decreased blood viscosities with fat. Those were in peer-reviewed medical journals. And also a lot of data um, with phosphatidylcholine as well, uh, increasing uh, blood flow and the prevention of red blood cell aggregation sedimentation. Now, the other things uh, that we do as preventative and integrative functional doctors, and I call them the usual suspects, is eliminate smoking, um, aggressively evaluate your patient for insulin resistance. You know, we use the uh, glucose tolerance insulin resistance test here at Meridian Valley uh, based upon um, that research to sometimes get ahead of the curve up, up to seven to ten years is what I've seen cited in the literature as when we see insulin resistance before uh, preceding the development of frank diabetes. So it's a tremendous opportunity to get ahead of the, ahead of the ball on these patients. Also increasing their HDL. Uh, again, phosphatidylcholine acts like an artificial HDL and where it will increase HDL and also lower LDL. And then treating any inflammation systemically, of course, looking at the gut, looking at food panels to see uh, if there's proper digestion, sufficient stomach acid, all of those things, um, you know, looking, you know, teeth, just looking at the things that everyone is familiar with as uh, the usual suspects in causing uh, systemic inflammation because that's going to increase whole blood viscosity as well. We look at treatment modalities. We've mentioned several, a simple overview, hydration, a uh, number of literatures with that, diet, exercise. Uh, patients that exercise actually decrease their blood viscosity. It's uh, one of the perhaps unmentioned uh, benefits of exercising. We look at different supplementations, you know, natokinase, the omega-3s, other systemic protease enzymes, therapeutic phlebotomies, apheresis, you know, this would be just uh, establishing a rapport with your local blood bank center. And uh, they're, you know, depending upon your blood type, uh, you know, if you have a, a fairly rare blood type, then they're more than able and, and ready to take two units of your blood and then again, exercising and balancing hormones. Physiologically, I think a lot of the problems we saw with the pharmaceutical or um, hormone replacement was that they were unbalanced, but also they had a dramatic effect on increasing the uh, blood viscosity. And then again, back to hydration again, looking at different modalities of hydrating there. We look at a lot of the recent innovations in measuring blood viscosities. Um, they really stemmed out of the petrochemical paint industry. Uh, I used to uh, have a minor in chemistry, worked as a chemist in a uh, petrochemical facility, and I measured blood viscosity, I mean uh, lubricant uh, viscosities, but I was using them at only one single shear. Uh, in other words, um, only a single point shear detection was what these machines were capable of. So they weren't able to tell how the viscosity changed in these fluids, um, how that varied either with temperature or, or different shear rates. And I think one of the largest innovations to date uh, and the only FDA approved uh, plasma viscosity and whole blood viscosity diagnostic in the world currently is the Hemothix. And um, we're proud at Meridian Valley to be the first commercial laboratory to provide whole blood viscosities. Um, I've been using beta models uh, of, this of this specific machine for over a decade. And we've actually found it provided a very unique way of measuring the blood viscosities throughout the cardiac cycle. We're looking at over 10,000 different shear rates or over 10,000 specific data points uh, on the blood viscosity that we're able to capture as the blood changes thickness between diastole and systole. 
one of the encouraging things is that this uh, blood viscosity can be performed you know in your la in our laboratory and that the stability of the specimens uh, can be sent from uh, remote locations such as uh, various different clinics and hospitals and we have uh, a number of studies validating the stability of those and we bring those in on a um, a cold pack and we have stability for those for at least four days uh, we try to capture that within a couple of days and we're able to uh, provide an accurate uh, blood viscosity parameters for clinicians uh, on their patients in a very timely manner. We've developed a new whole blood viscosity profile. Uh, it will give you two numbers, uh, uh, systolic and diastolic. And again, you're, you're able to look at uh, these endpoints. And we've defined those. We've changed the units there to correlate more with blood pressure uh, to, to millipoise by simply moving a decimal there. But uh, I currently have uh, completed some other research, and I found that blood viscosity was more sensitive than actual the vital sign blood pressure in determining the risk factors for the uh, patients in this specific study. Again, we look at monitoring the whole aspect of whole blood viscosity as a, a relationship between testing the patients, triaging, finding which patients are at high risk, allowing the clinician to, to have an early intervention, and then the blood viscosity as a useful tool to continual monitoring, not only of specific treatments, uh, dosings of whatever antiviscic agents you're using and therapies, but also to target those and to do an overall evaluation there and also identify specific areas in blood viscosity. Is there a problem with this patient that's affecting their diastolic blood viscosity or their low shear blood viscosity or is it a high shear blood viscosity issue? Those will be able to um, clearly become evident to the clinician by reviewing the blood reports and then it over, provides an overall program for defining how to increase the overall perfusion as well as recruitment of uh, blood for the cardiocerebrovascular. One book that I think uh, is, stands as the foundation for this whole new idea of blood viscosity being the common den den denominator is the origin of atherosclerosis. And it basically goes to define you know, what really initiates the inflammatory process. And in this pivotal publication, Dr. Kinsey and Dr. Cho actually define what we call the protective adaptation theory, where they see clearly illustrate in mathematics how the blood becomes thick and it actually uh, and it explains why blood viscosity occurs uh, at specific areas and it causes different uh, you know site specific as well as region specific uh, inflammatory processes and actually discusses the overall pathophysiology from increased blood viscosity, arterial sclerosis, the stiffening of the arteries, and then clearly goes on to showing the development of atherosclerosis as well. All right, I see we have a few questions here, and uh, if we have time, I'd like to entertain those. Okay, our first question here uh, from our listener is, how do you get two blood viscosity numbers? And do you need two blood draws? Okay. Um, what we uh, excellent question. Thank you. Um, what I what we we have over ten thousand data points. What we're trying to do is present the bookends. It's one sample, uh, but 
what we do basically is do the endpoints of the blood viscosity. And what we have is a, we plot all those 10,000 data points between diastolic and systolic and then provide you the bookends or the end numbers there for therapy. And how we're able to do that is the, the real brilliance of the Hemothex is that they use a scanning tube viscometer. And for those, uh, if I can you just review a little bit of physics, remember the, uh, the old stone at the top of the hill had all the potential energy. It rolls down the hill and it, the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. Well, if you isolate, uh, re, we take the blood, draw it up into a capillary tube that mimics the inside of a blood, human blood vessel, and then we drop it. So in this analogy, our blood is the stone rolling down the hill. This blood drops from the left tube, it's a U-tube, drops through and goes in front of a photoelectric multiplying tube. That's why we're able to capture so many data points. And then by working out a single variable and a correction factor, we're able to delineate what the blood viscosity is throughout the cardiac cycle. Next question, question two. Uh, patient states, at what point in pregnancy would you recommend testing whole blood viscosity if you're trying to screen for potential preeclampsia? Well, excellent question. Um, a lot, um, like many things with prenatal care, uh, there, there's, uh, I think any time a woman is uh, potentially uh, is fertile is a good time or planning a family or as part of a routine comprehensive uh, health care uh, phys uh, physical, is, it's appropriate at that time. But more importantly, if a patient, a female, has a history of miscarriages or uh, difficulties with pregnancies, then I think this is a very reasonable and important tool to predict whether this patient is a, a potential um, you know, has, has susceptibility to developing preeclampsia. Question number three, uh, what hematocrit value would raise alarms for you about blood viscosity? Excellent question there. Uh, as you remember, 50% uh, of uh, all patients with increased blood viscosity is directly attributable to their increased blood viscosity or a hematocrit, excuse me. So if we look at males in general, uh, they run a little bit higher, as we all know, hematocrit. I like to keep those patient, the male patient population down around 40 to 42 hematocrit. What I see there is that for the most part, their whole blood viscosities will normalize, meaning that they'll be in uh, ranges there of uh, systolic uh, blood, uh, blood viscosity 40 or below, and then diastolic, uh, 100 or below. Now for females, uh, their hematocrit, we, uh, usually I see, I would go a little bit lower, those run anywhere between 38 to 40 hematocrits, and I see that at those points, with those hematocrits, their blood viscosities are again below 40 and 100 respectively, um, uh, with the systolic and, or what we call high and low shear blood viscosities, respectfully. And this is our last question. Uh, what is apheresis? That's an excellent question. Um, I didn't know that word for a while. Uh, but apheresis is actually a process in which we can uh, isolate or collect various components of blood. Uh, those can be lipoproteins, we call that lipoprotein apheresis. They can be red blood cells, we call that red blood cell apheresis. Uh, or as many of your blood centers have done, they can actually um, isolate platelets as well as uh, plasma. So those are just uh, a way of uh, collecting various 
uh, specific components of the blood. And again, what makes blood thick 50% of the time is the volume of red blood cells. Those are my, uh, those, that's the aggregate in the concrete. And again, effectively, uh, if you can do two unit apheresis, you can uh, have your patients donate every four months, three times a year, I tell them. And I've seen that uh, as an excellent uh, tool to help manage whole blood viscosities. And I'm excited to announce today that Dr. Pushpa Larson will be presenting uh, her presentation or webinar on DHEA, the multidimensional hormone. Stay tuned. That's January 16, 2011. Oh, 12, excuse me. And that's going to be at 11 a.m. on uh, Pacific Coast time. And again, thank you for your time and attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Holsworth, for your presentation. Um, we hope you enjoyed it and you, you were able to get a lot of information from it. Uh, this presentation and these slides will be available in our archives on our website. You will be contacted um, if you participated in this um, on how to access it. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email us at info at meridianvalleylab.com. And with that, thank you and have a nice day.